It says permission needed. Okay. Welcome everyone to the new JFK show number 288. We've got Jim Fetzer, Larry Rivera, myself, Gary King, and Rick Russo, who we'd like to introduce to the show. And also we'd like, Rick, welcome to the show. And could you tell us a little bit about yourself and about the presentation you have for us tonight? I can add a few words well, right off the bat. Rick, Rick had a keen interest in the medical technicians at Bethesda and did sensational work early on. So he has a long-standing history of involvement in a rather deep and searching way. Rick, further. Well, uh, first of all, um, before I begin, I want to thank uh, Larry for taking the time to download and uh, organize the photos that we're going to have as part of this uh, presentation tonight. And uh, actually, Jim, I want to thank you. Uh, you don't realize this, but 30 years ago, last month, you had uh, set up an introduction for me with Dr. Herbert Spiegel in New York in order to allow me to bring Dennis David there to be hypnotized. That's right. That's right. You're absolutely right, Rick. Wow. 30 I years can't ago. believe how time flies, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was sensational because Dennis David could remember <clears throat> every keystroke when he typed up about the bullet fragments that had been <clears throat> removed from the body. You know, um, I had never seen anybody hypnotized before. And uh, Spiegel was probably the best in the business at what he did. And, uh, you know, I guess there's various scales, uh, ranges of people who are susceptible to hypnosis, hypnosis. And on a scale of one to 10, Dennis David was right up there almost a 10. And he went back in time at that point, you know, this, we're talking about 93. He went back in time 30 years in the first person. It's like he, he's actually there telling us what he's seen. It was unbelievable. I'd never experienced anything like that before or since. I think uh, at the time you told me, Dr. Siegel said on a scale of one to 10, Dennis David was an 11. <laughs> All right. I, I, that was being, yeah, that was theatrical, but I, I, I would stand by that. Yeah. I, I guess uh, we could say he, he, was, was he was not candidate. a 10. He was an 11. He was a perfect candidate for hypnosis. And I mean, what an historic development that was. Well, it was certainly helpful for him to try to recall certain things, especially the time he spent a few days after the uh, autopsy uh, night with uh, Bill Pitzer and looking at those film materials and seeing what was on that. You know, that was very important to, to get that recollection and, uh, and uh, you know, and a lot of the other things that he remembered as well. Uh, Rick, uh, what's your, very briefly here, because we don't want to get uh, go off on a tangent. What's your uh, take on Pitzer? <clears throat> I, I believe he was murdered. Okay. Well, so I mean, first of all, regardless of the, the investigation that the FBI did and, and getting into all the techno techno. Uh, Technica um, technicalities as far as, you know, there was no, um, what do you call it, when you see a, a bullet wound, the, the stippling, uh, you know, around the wound and all that, right. you know, showing that he couldn't have held the gun right to his head. But the body was find, found underneath a ladder, and above the ladder was a ceiling tile that had been moved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the death of Pitzer takes place exactly one day before. Bobby Kennedy gives the deed a gift of the autopsy pictures and x-rays to the National Archives. Now, maybe, uh -huh. you know, that's coincidence. But, and then you get into the whole Colonel Dan Marvin scenario of right, the story. Right, right. Who which awesome. I believe, uh, I, I've met Dan Marvin. I went with one of the few first people to interview him before I even brought him to Nigel for the Men Who Killed Kennedy back in 95. And he, he struck me as a very honest man. You know, he had no reason to concoct any of the things that he said. So uh, <clears throat> I believe Pitzer was murdered. What about people? Okay, and I had this just last one. You know, uh, there was a researcher by the name of Eaglesham who, who first advanced the suicide and then did a 180 on that. Uh, any comment on that? That's just a mystery to me. You know, uh, I thought he did a great job. I think in the third decade doing articles showing 
how, you know, it had to have been a murder, you know, and, and analyzing the FBI uh, investigation report and all the other elements pertaining to, to the death of Pitzer and, and coming up with a, with a real solid conclusion. And then over a period of time, he did a complete 180. And I have absolutely no re, you know, no idea why that happened, to be honest with you. Okay. It didn't make sense to me, but. All right. Well, man, you, we have, we, we got to bring this guy more often, Jim and Gary, because there's a lot of stuff to cover here, you know? <clears throat> that was just Absolutely. what I was going to say. And the fact, uh, there's no doubt Pitzer was murdered. His, his hand was mangled. He was left-handed in his left hand, Rick, as I recall, was mangled. I mean, you know, this was totally phony. They wanted to get whatever video he had since he had recorded. He'd actually filmed the entire autopsy. Right. So he was murdered as a way to, you know, get rid of a witness who was in a crucial position. And he and Dennis David were very, very close. So Dennis mm -hmm. David was really quite distraught over his death. But mm -hmm. I have no, yes, I don't was. have an iota of hesitation to say that Pitzer was murdered. He was assassinated because it was for political motives. Mm -hmm. Well, right. perhaps somebody was concerned. He may have talked to friends. You know, he may have been leaving sometime in the near future, uh, you know, the military. And if he had copies of the materials that Dennis David saw uh, back in 63, uh, then that was very dangerous uh, to a lot of people right. who had already put forth, you know, what they did. So uh, I, I know we're dig digressing here, but if you want, I can start. You know, uh, no, what, yeah, what, what, what Larry what is I'm, saying, what Larry is saying, Rick is you're a wealth of information about aspects of the assassination that are rather obscure and not well known and that we'd like to have you back right to address some of those in the near future yeah. well we'll By see way, we'll, let's showing, see how tonight let's see how tonight goes <laughs> larry's showing you can't see it because you're not on a screen but larry's showing lee oswald passport which specifically is labeled that travel to cuba is not permitted so, I mean, you know, the whole story about him going down. Yeah, that to... was excellent work that Larry did on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to put up the very first uh, slide here, which, of course, is the <clears> number one. Okay. Well, well and before, we, before we get to that, I just want to do a, a quick thing. Uh, tonight, I would like to talk about the Mary Mormon Polaroid image and the Phil Willis number five photograph. Right. But most importantly... I would like to discuss the credibility of Tom Wilson, Gordon Arnold, and Ed Hoffman. And before we get to that, I guess we could bring the first image up, which is, I guess, the Mormon Polaroid. Right. right. Okay. And the, the, the Associated Press acquired the rights to, to this image and basically were responsible for the version that we see not only today, but we've seen over the last God knows how many years. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, bringing up image number two, it should be uh, a tight shot of the back of uh, the president's head. We and you could, see that, yeah, you could see that it's been darkened by retouching, not only the back of the head, but the back of his suit jacket. Uh, yeah. That whole area is darkened to the point where um, and, and I could be wrong about this recollection, Gerald Posner, when he wrote Case Closed and was out in the media, whatever, had told people that looking at the Mormon Polaroid, it was taken just a second before the headshot. And the reason why he, he was able to state that was because that whole area of the back of the head is, is dark, you know, so there's no, there's no, you know, evidence of any kind of wound there. Um, <clears throat> before we go to the next image, I just want to tell you a little anecdote on the, uh, on the, um, 50th anniversary. So that's what, 10 years ago, I decided to just stay home. Everybody was going to Dallas, I guess, but I decided to stay home and just, uh, watch all the TV specials that were going on. And then, uh, one of them aired on C-SPAN and it was a 1964 CBS special called the Warren Report. And in this special, in got Walter Cronkite doing the voiceover. In the special, there's an interview with um, uh, Mary Mormon. She's standing on the street there. 
Uh, they've interviewed her on Elm Street, and they're talking to her about what she experienced that day and where she was and all this stuff. And then after they do that little interview, we hear Walter Cronkite's voice segueing to the fact that, and this is the image of the photograph that Ms. Mormon took. And I guess now we can go to image number three. Uh, we're not getting any images. Apparently, the yeah, screen no, share. share. No, I, I just uh, went back to okay. the conversation while Rick yeah. was talking. Here it is. This is the fuzzy one. But, you know, Rick, I wanted to add, I mean, Gerald Bosner saying it was a moment before. Actually, it was just a moment after because, you know, they touched it up, as you're observing, which Bosner was seeking to conceal. That's what he's going to get into now. Yeah. <clears throat> well, well, that's obviously Bosner was able to try to make that comment because there's nothing that we can see in this retouched Mormon photograph that had been on the wire services for so many years you know, uh, to hide the true evidence uh, of, of what had happened to the president. But image, right. are you able to bring up image number three? Yeah, yeah. there it is. Okay. There it is. Yeah. This, okay, yeah, number three. Would you say there's a slight difference between number three and number two? Of course. Actually, bring oh. up number four, because that's a side-by-side -side comparison. I don't know how it looks on your monitor. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's perfect. Yeah. So what you can see there is the fact that CBS somehow had a copy of the Mormon image before anybody had retouched it. And you can obviously see a, a large blowout. I don't know how the quality translated to what I sent you, to what you've got on the screen now. But you can see it's a large blowout in the back of Kennedy's head in that CBS image that you don't see in the uh, Associated Press wire service version that, that we also have there. Larry, you can see a big blowout. My goodness. All right. Larry, can you have to <clears throat> define the blowout here? Uh, are we addressing the uh, split screen here? Yeah, uh, split yeah, screen. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and I suppose that the uh, published one is the one on the right? No, the published one is the one on the left. Okay, okay. And the one on the right, you can maybe... Circle around the blowout in the head with your mouse. Well, see, that's what I'm trying to say. Where, where exactly is the right blowout? There. I mean, right there. There it is. Okay. The the wider. Oh, okay, element. okay, 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 okay. I, I see. Okay, okay, okay. I, I I see it now. I see it now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> see. But obviously, just even comparing the two images in the back of the head, it's worlds apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it just goes to show you that this material in some people's hands did exist back then before it was repressed. And unfor unfortunately for CBS, somehow they, I, I well, remember there were no VCRs back in the day. So you saw the show live and that was it. And you probably had a second to retain what it was you were watching anyway. You know what I mean? But thank God the mo for modern t technology all, me all these years later, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Next. So. Uh, before we go to number five, I want to talk a little okay, bit about. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but before we get to number five, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, some about Tom Wilson uh, worked for U.S. Steel for 30 years using image processing to examine metal for stru structural defects. And we don't have the image. We don't have the image anymore. Gary. Yeah, that, Dr. Well, Fess is okay. working. He's talking about Tom Wilson. I mean, okay. Larry, I'm doing this deliberately. When, oh, when... Okay. okay, yeah, we're not getting to number five yet. Uh, we'll get there in just a second. I just want to uh, do a little intro. Uh, what Tom Wilson did, for instance, uh, the human eye can distinguish 16 shades of gray, a computer image processor analyzing a photographic or film image can distinguish 250 shade, 56, I'm sorry, shades of gray. So that's, that's a tremendous uh, difference in, in trying to, to really get information out of these uh, uh, materials. Uh, so bring up image number five. Okay. Now what you're looking at there is a camera with fingers on the right side. 
and and Tom had actually mentioned this find. He he he. This is from the the Mormon Polaroid as well uh, over the years. But I had never actually seen it until after he passed away and his book came out with all of his uh, with all of his photographic work. But uh, this is a uh, a man holding a camera in the Mormon photograph in the area where Badge Man is. Let me go, and, uh, let me go I, back to the Mormon and see if we can figure out what we're talking about. Badgeman is supposed to be here. And you're saying there's a man holding a camera, maybe here, closer toward the edge of the... Uh, well, well, you can't discern a head or any... I mean, what, what Tom Wilson did, he was able to discern and bring out the actual physical camera that this, right. this individual is holding. And he would be in the area that we had been told Gordon Arnold was in, in the Mormon photograph way back in the Gordon, day. You mean on Gary the steps? And, you, mean, you mean over on the steps, Rick? No, we're the badge man. If you've seen the old okay, work done okay, by Gary right. Mack and okay, Jack White. Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. Right in this area. Okay, we got it. And, right, and, and and they said at the time they thought that was Gordon Arnold. But uh, in any event, this is a man with a 16 millimeter camera in that area and, and uh image number six i found was just a photograph of a man with that kind of camera back from the 60s where you can actually see um you know his right hand grasping the side of the camera the fingers just the way you see it in tom wilson's uh processing of of the mormon uh, that's image. a huge mother effing camera my yeah. god look at the size of that thing. well they had they had they had various versions of that aeroflex that had smaller film canisters on the top but i was just looking for an image that showed the man the way he would hold it and the way his fingers would be on the camera you know what i mean to give you a, a, some kind of comparison as far as what you were seeing and in yeah. uh, the work that Wilson had, yeah. had found. And we, do, we do know one so, thing, they blotted out a lot of cameras in all the pictures that we have. Larry's pointed that out many times where there's women holding cameras and it's all blotted out and many, many <clears throat> were flashing pictures. Yeah, so they can yeah, conceal yeah. the fact yeah. that there's a lot of missing evidence that they've deliberately suppressed. Go yeah, ahead, Rick. Right. Well, uh, to, 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 to basically complement what we just talked about, now that we have, through Tom Wilson, the image of uh, somebody holding uh, this camera, uh, now let's go to the story of uh, Rich Della Rosa. And he, cl he claimed that he viewed uh, the film, or a film, in yeah. 1974, 1976, and again in, in the 1990s, and he said it was a 16-millimeter film he then adds that the film he saw, and this is important, was taken from a different angle than the Zabruder film, making it another film, not the quote unquote other Zabruder film. He said he saw the film twice when a, when a, as a college student, and then a third time under classified conditions while on active military duty. So again, what's important about what Rich experienced is the fact that He's seen film taken by somebody other than Abraham Zabruder from a different angle, which now gives us a little bit of uh, corroboration for this cameraman that Tom Wilson had uh, discovered in the Mormon photograph. I think so, Rich said he'd you know, seen that the, by, the, I think Rich said he'd seen the other film three different times, which is rather remarkable in itself. Amazing. Well, you know. <clears throat> Well, let's get to the uh, Larry, uh, maybe we, we can got, come up with an lost... explanation. Hang yeah. on, Larry, have we lost? No, no, I'm no, no, I'm 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 checking something out. I, I, okay. Gonna... Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm going back to the okay. image, uh, Rick. Uh, now we got that very first that would be relation to Rip Rich. Yeah, Enlargement yeah. number 2. This is Okay. This is... Uh but... But before we get to image number uh, seven, I just yeah. want to give one more bit of corroboration for our cameraman up there. In, in, in 2016, Shauna Willis went public with a story about her father. And unfortunately, uh, his name has been given, but I, I don't have it with, you know, to share with you tonight. I just didn't you know, look it up. 
uh, she originally just called him Phil. And this is not to be con con uh, confused with the Willis family or Phil Willis. This is somebody completely different. And in and, and telling the story about her father, she said, quote, Dad was a retired Master Chief, U.S. Navy Photo Intelligence. His DD-214 is dated 11-23-63. She stated that he had other intelligence uh, clearances and had taken film during the assassination. She stated again that her father worked in the military as a photo intelligence officer and had taken film behind the picket fence on top of the knoll. No. And then she goes God. a little further. No. And then she goes further, and she goes further to say. Uh, when the HSCA was established in 1976, because dad previously worked with ONI and CIA, he said that they came to him and asked him to pull and make new prints of the JFK materials from the DPD, which is Dallas Police Department, for the HSCA. So here we actually have the man. We have the cameraman, father of Shauna Willis. And, uh, and, and, and so I think this comes full circle to kind of establish the fact that we actually had a guy with a camera in that area. So and, you're, uh, suggesting and Tom was this, you're suggesting the I'm camera sorry? that Tom Wilson identified was Willis. No, not Willis. No, no, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, Willis, yeah, Willis's father. Yeah. Well, Willis is, is Shauna Willis's father. Not Phil. I, not to be confused with Phil Willis. Right. No, I understand. Shana, we understand. But that's right, right. I don't. Is, his name. His last name, uh, Jim, was not Willis. Her okay. her married name, I think, must be. I don't know what. I can't well, remember what his actual name was. It, they actually it, kept it, it okay. secret okay, for okay. Water, okay. for quite a while. You know. But you've even um, figured out who the camera one was that Tom Wilson identified in the Mormon Polaroid. Yeah. I guess we have him. And thanks to Shauna coming forward uh, back in 2016. I believe it's she's quite a quite a bomb to drop, by the way. You know, even at that late date. Yeah. yeah. With a picture. To well, it, all the piece, all, all the pieces of the puzzle have been out there, but now they're slowly, finally being able to be assembled and 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 put together, so we can actually get get a clear sense. Uh, of, of what was really going on at that time, you know? Well, so yeah, Jack, um, Jack, Jack White maintained that in the Bronson and Jim published this, uh, that uh, Zapruder couldn't have filmed the uh, assassination because, yeah. because he was being blocked by his secretary, Mary Sitzman, you know, and. Uh, yeah, that, that, that whole thing that was going on up there, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I don't even know. You know what the deal was with Zabruder, but uh, oh. well, I was, <coughs> yeah, really, was um, telling you, yeah, well, no, he was one next. of the greats. Should I go to the yeah, next? let's go to image now? Let's go to image number seven, okay? We're okay, there. this is a blow up of Roy Kellerman in the Mormon photograph, uh, sitting in the front seat. As you can see, he's, uh, he's got some kind of book or, or something he's actually putting in front of his face at that time. Now, when, when Wilson, Tom Wilson was doing his work on the Mormon photograph, and remember, his, his uh, software and hardware was you know, used for finding defects and anomalies in steel and metal and that kind of thing. And in working the Mormon photograph, lo and behold, he discovers a metallic anomaly which through processing revealed a bullet slug lodged in the steel arch above the Connollys, yeah. which the removable roof would sit on. And that should be photos eight, nine, and 10. So you, you want to do it in Kellerman was shielding himself with something? Well, in that tight shot of Kellerman, he put some kind of a book or something up in front of his face. You know, I, I you hate to speculate about any of the stuff in this case, but I think that he may have very well at that moment been re responding to a shot that came through the windshield. You know, exactly, yeah. exactly. Which and he was reacting to this spickling 
hitting his face, and that is shown in uh, even in the Z film. Yeah, all the broken uh, glass. Yeah. yeah, Spickling, you know, right. and, and he, that's what he was reaching for his cheek there because he felt that sting there, you know, from what I've heard. So uh, in any event, in this sequence of photos eight, nine, and 10, it shows the work that Wilson did, the, the, the you know, the sequence of, of processing that part of the Mormon photograph and finding this uh, this anomaly, this slug that had been lodged uh, in the I arch. Never, I never heard about that one before, Rick. Uh, um, uh, we're not we're not talking about the bullet that hit the chrome strip above the windshield, the front nope, windshield. No, no, we're not talking. Nope, no. Nope, We're talking about the divider nope. where the bubble top rests. You know, from back yeah. to front. Right. Think of the McDonald's arches. And there yeah, was an arch there's, right yeah, above the Connollys in between their seats right. and the Secret Service guys in the front. And that's where you would put the roof back on top. Right. That's what it would sit on. Yeah, that's and I, somehow I in a one in a one in a million, a bullet slug lodged in that metallic chrome. Arch. That's actually chrome. That's actually chrome. And I actually modeled it into the uh, Blender uh, 3D uh, uh, model of the limousine because it's it's like you said it arches from you know from one side to the other and it's right in the middle of the of the limo and uh that's where the uh, bubble top yes uh rests you know right right and and photos eight and nine basically show tom wilson's process uh of how he got to where he got and number 10 is four polaroid pictures that he sent me that i ran a color laser copy of that really show enlargement of the actual slug. Yeah, yeah, go back. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's very good. in there. Okay, I was wondering that what that was. Good, good. Good. That's that's excellent. So so uh so we have Tom Wilson's work uh in the Mormon photograph discovering and, another another slug. More and, evidence. And, and it came by mistake that discovery. Is that right, uh, Rick? I mean, by well, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how he actually his 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 computer software must have registered some kind of defect. Right. You know, I meant by uh, metallic defect. Yeah. 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 I'm sure that's how it happened. And then he worked it and worked it, which is what he did. He was a professional at streaming down the uh, the grayscale until he was able to come up with what we are looking at right now. Yeah. And with the technology that was available at the time, obviously. Yeah. So is this is the same fellow that was on the man who killed Kennedy? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm familiar with that show. And you know where he said <clears throat> that the, that the uh, headshot came from. Yep. <laughs> he, he 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 put the gun he put the gunman for the final headshot in the sewer. And if you look at that Mormon photograph from CBS that we looked at a, a few minutes ago with that large defect in the back of the head now, which is the Mormon photograph was the source for him doing his trajectories uh, for the bullet sh well, shots and, anyway. And, and, so you can see where it would go right and, into the ground, right into the sewer. You know? And that's the only way it lines up, Rick, because if you look at uh, uh, Jeff K's head and position, as he's going down Elm Street at Z312, 313, his head in, is in a position of 60 degrees forward. And when you have that type of a a alignment, it's the only way, the only source would have been the storm drain. There is no doubt about it. And, you know, like I <clears> said, <throat> you know, the people on, on our side are Penn Jones, and I think John Dr. Judge, Judge that. Vincent Salandria, you know, on and on and on and on. <laughs> Go well, ahead. there's an issue. Well, there's an <clears throat> issue here. I mean, David and I went down to the storm drain. David climbed into the storm drain. I agree. And it had been filled with cement. According to John Judge, it had been filled at least a couple of feet where uh, at the beginning he, he would get in there and up to his armpits. And then later on, you know, he would only fit up to his waist, you know. And uh, so that kind of changed, <clears throat> obviously, you know. Yeah, but David believe the angle was wrong for the headshot to have been fired from the storm drain this is it a very may, may, very I, may, 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 may i address that yeah okay. uh two things well number one as far as having a guy being able to fit in there 
uh, back in the 70s, this, uh, this writer who was actually very anti-conspiracy, writing for the um, Texas Monthly Magazine uh, with Penn Jones, actually went in, and went into the sewer. And he himself had to admit that there was room for somebody to, to be in there. And the problem over the years is, is that they paved Elm Street over and over and over again. So the, the, the size of the actual you know, hole right. itself uh, or in front of the, it has been diminished probably by 50%. It's when true. I was in Dallas years ago, when I first wanted to look at this whole situation, I went to one of the sewer openings on that side road in front of the uh, depository that wasn't actually, it was offshoot from Elm Street. And I looked at their sewer open opening and it was twice as much, twice as large it's as the one on, on Elm Street. Elm Street. So yeah. that, you know, you can't use that to, to define your, your, your understanding of this. But number two, I, people keep attributing the shot from the sewer with 313, or at least where they put the X uh, on Elm Street, and that's, <clears throat> that's incorrect. Uh, exactly. Whatever exactly. shot hit Kennedy at that point was not the sewer shot. The, the limousine continued to move forward and slightly to the left, and as the limousine came more down Elm Street that, and then slowed to a stop, that aligned the shot from the sewer and the guy wasn't using a rifle. He was using a 45 yeah. with a silencer because anything else would have blown his eardrums out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and that's, and, and, and that's, and, the, and that's, and it's, the, and it's agreed that, uh, Greer brought the limo to a complete stop because we know from the, uh, escort, you know, in the Newcomb tapes, what happened, you know, right after that. Right. And, and the reason why the reason why when Wilson went down to Dealey Plaza to, to do, uh, you know, the, the whole, you know, trying to trace, you know, where the shots came from. He didn't use any Zabruder film because they couldn't be trusted time wise or any wise. And he only used the Polaroid, the Mormon Polaroid, because it's a fixed photograph with fixed positions around uh, the sewer areas, so you can actually do a, tra a fair trajectory and an honest one, uh, exactly, you know, when and where that, that shot came from. And so, uh, you know, he did some terrific work uh, using the Mormon uh, image. But let, um, me, <clears throat> let me reiterate David and I went to the sewer. David climbed into the sewer. Well, he said, He said, the angle was wrong for that to have been a headshot. Now, a 45 with a silencer? Jesus Christ, man, that would have taken the man's head off. But David- I just don't know, Rick, I do not know about this. I will ask David. I'm going to send him this show. <clears throat> well, 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 I would ask- what David is an oncologist. Well, He's not a forensic- Well, I, I guess the question, the question that I have, Jim, is where, aside from being inside the sewer and you have an opening that's only 50% of what it was back in 63. So it's, you know, that's already against you. But I, besides I that, mean, where, did, where did David Mantic put the actual limousine that he was trying to fire shot to? Where, yeah, where would he have placed that down. limousine? We know it was further down than Elm Street. Uh, yeah, we know the, that. What the X is. We know right. that, Rick. But I mean, I, I I will address this. This is a big question. I'm just saying, based upon previous experience being there, and remember, the guy's a leading well, expert on the head wounds at JFK in the world today. I mean, this is yeah, but that, but, he's, but but until he does what Tom Wilson did, which is put himself physically on Elm yeah. Street in the place, no, no, in the place where JFK was sitting in the Mormon photograph and then do a trajectory from back through the front, because that's, you know, where the, sh and to try to find where the shot came from. As Larry would say, it leads only in one place like downward and into the ground. And, and, and you got to understand the other thing about this. When Wilson went there, he had no set agenda. He had no idea where the shot for the head shot had come from. He knew that, you know, where the exit wound was in the back of the head and where he felt the entrance wound was on the forehead. But other than that, he didn't have a set agenda. And he was shocked when he realized, my God, this is going into the ground. And then all of a sudden you realize there's a sewer opening there. Yeah, and got it, got it, got it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share this with David, as I say, and we'll get his reaction. Larry, go ahead. <clears throat> well, David has my book and it's included in the, in the book. And, uh, 
I, I just I just cite uh, you know the chapter uh, in my book that addresses that issue, uh, and you know. Uh, well, you know, Larry, this is something I've overlooked, and you also believe that shot a shot to the head was fired from inside the sewer opening. No, it co it's covered in the book, I believe, chapter uh, 18. Yeah, addresses that entire yeah, scenario. look into this more. So, all right. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have another slide yeah. coming. Yeah, a bunch of... Oh, we got other slides. We got quite a few of them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, um, the reason why I wanted to talk about Tom Wilson, and then we'll get into this next uh, image, uh, number 11, is, is the fact that if you go on the if you go on the internet, whether it's the uh, education forum or these various JFK assassination Facebook pages, and you see Tom Wilson's name brought up, the majority of the people responding to that are calling him a fraud. No. And the reason they do that is because they have absolutely no understanding of his experience, his technology, the equipment he had, the software he had, or anything else. It's just, again, a knee-jerk knee reaction to seeing something they can't comprehend or assimilate or understand, and therefore they'll just dismiss it arbitrarily. But everything in this case needs to be corroborated. Science needs to be corroborated with eyewitnesses or vice versa, and that's the only way you can actually then say this is factual truth. Hypothesis Listen, yeah. and speculation by itself doesn't, doesn't, doesn't you know, doesn't do it. You really have to back up what you're in. So I presented you just now with Tom Wilson discovering a slug in that arch in the limousine. Now, by itself, then you're faced with, well, I'll either accept Wilson's science and his discovery, or I won't. So how do we, pr how do we prove that this actually happened? What Tom Wilson did not know, first of all, I did not know that Tom Wilson was working and had found this in the Mormon photograph. What Tom Wilson didn't know is the fact that 1994, when I was selling these video cassettes, I had licensed, as you guys know, the men who killed Kennedy for video after A&E had run it, you know, back in, you know, the fall of 91. Uh, and people would call up A&E wanting to buy, you know, the set, and they couldn't because they didn't have the right, so they'd give the my telephone number. So one day I got a phone call from a guy in Cincinnati. You want to bring up the uh, Hessen Eisenhardt slide now, number 11? Sure, but I want to add another word about what we're talking about here in terms of replicability and so forth. Because in my discussions, and I think I had them with both John Costello and with David Mantic, the problem with Tom Wilson's analysis, for example, of the wound to the back of the head, which is awesome was not knowing how to replicate it. Now, Rick, we need to be able to replicate it. That was their reservation and why it couldn't be taken for granted that it was right, even though it was, I mean, fascinating. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, highly plausible, but there was a need to be able to replicate. Are you capable of specifying well, how we say replicate? replicate? I, don't, I don't understand quite what you're saying replicate how we can use the same technique he used what exactly was a technique he used to discern those layers of the blowout to the back of the head do we well, have I think anybody that ha who I, I think anybody who's a professional uh computer image processing analyst given that material i'm sure could probably uh duplicate all of wilson's work because it's not you know it's science. It's not something that one man comes up with and somebody else is going to come up with a different thing. The thing is, none of us own that equipment. None of us have that expertise. And uh, and and even going to what Wilson did in Dealey Plaza to try to find the trajectory of the shot that struck Kennedy in the front, no one else that I've seen in all these documentaries over the years has ever done the same thing, which is start from the exit wound in the back of the head, work through the front, and see where that bullet came from. Everything else that we've seen is starting with a shot that came out of Kennedy, the front of Kennedy said, a la Zabruder film, go out the back of his head up to the sixth floor window. That's what's been done over the years. But nobody but Wilson ever did the real way that this thing should be analyzed. You those know? shots, 
No shots were fired from the sixth floor. We know the bullshit, Rick. No, but that's the way these documentaries and Dale Myers and all these other people, that's how that's the way they want us to to, to well, understand course, it. But and, no no one here and no one we're talking about is played by that bullshit. None of us. Go to eyes. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying what I'm saying, Jim, is when these doc when these documentaries were done for Discovery Channel, whatever, they put a limousine right there at 313 or wherever they the X on Elm Street. And then with a laser, they would they would have a thing going from Kennedy's head back to the window. Never once did they think or even attempt to do it in reverse and go, all right, let's start from the back of his head and go forward and see where that laser goes. What's Never it, did it. The, the same, what the Tom same Wilson did. And I have to also, uh, uh, also uh, to your point there, in the same manner that we did with the shot from under the uh, triple overpass, you know, going, you know, back and tracing it from the origin. And like I said, I just mentioned chapter 18 of my book uh, details and also cites Tom Wilson's uh, work and, and all the other uh, researchers like uh, Penn Jones, who used to crawl uh, through the uh, pipes there, uh, going through the manhole cover at the time, which like I said before, uh, went a lot, lot deeper. And you, uh, at, at one point, you know, he could uh, go through the very intricate pattern of, of uh, pipes and drainage uh, pipes that went under Dealey Plaza where he could go across Elm Street and then go uh, east and come out to uh, the basement of the Dallas Police Department. All right. Well, so well I'm glad you mentioned, I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things in episode six that dismayed me yeah, about Brissell, you know because Brissell, I wasn't yeah. there. I wasn't there when they shot the whole sequence with the sewer thing and Tom Wilson, whatever. Is that that this guy that I had put Jack, together Jack with Brazil. Nigel Turn, Jack, Jack Brazil, Brazil, right? Jack Brazil gets in the sewer, and then he supposedly walks a mile through these thing, ends up at the Trinity River to That's lead right. us to believe that that was the escape route, which was, was nonsense. Quick, and and it's a quick, it was a quick ten minutes. Yeah, but that's that that was completely wrong. It was nonsense. What people don't realize is that that series of sewer openings from the one that, you know, we're talking about right now where there was a man with a gun in diagonally right across the infield of of Dealey Plaza all the way across to where the South Knoll is and right up above to the South Knoll is that building that's a federal building. Yeah, I guess uh, at least annex. recent recent the year annex. recent the years that the U.S. Post Office was the located in there. It's called the but, Annex Building. The Annex Building. Do you know what in 1963 what other office was housed in that yeah, building? The Secret Service was there. Uh, the uh, Postal Inspector was there. You name it. <laughs> yeah, I got one more for you. The Office of Naval Intelligence. Why not? And I also want to say that. Uh, in the map of Dealey Plaza and in the 3D blender uh, rend rendition and model that I worked, for, uh, worked on for almost 10 years, there are many st uh, storm drains that are actually bilateral, you know, from one another. Because if you look at Dealey Plaza, it's almost, it's, in fact, it is completely a uh, mirror image of each other from uh, north to south, okay? So you've got the north part and you got a, and the pergolas are, are almost exactly the same. Now in, in there, and another, even another uh, uh, researcher suggested that there might've been a shot from one of the storm drains from the other side, all right? So, uh, and that I never really studied, you know, or anything, but I'm just telling you, you know, that, you know, those were positions of concealment that, uh, are ideal positions for snipers. They always shoot from concealed positions. And we know the cubby hole over there under uh, the triple underpass yeah. and the same, yeah. And, and you've got the diversions going on at the at the picket fence and, you know, and all over the place, you know, and the kill shot, boom, is, you know, concealed. I, absolutely, there's no doubt about it. Right, right. <clears throat> um... I know we digressed there for a second, but but what I wanted to tell you guys is we got image eleven up now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In nineteen ninety four, I get a call from this guy, Bill Carr from Cincinnati. He wants to buy the videos. And then at the, at the end of our conversation, he says, "You know, by the way, 
I've been trying to reach Nigel Turner and Oliver Stone, and I have no luck at all in, in connecting with these guys. And I have a friend up here who has some information. And he was one of the managers at Essen Eisenhardt. So he gives me the guy's uh, number, name and number, and I contact him. And then uh, just to kind of get a little credibility, I sent him a copy of the Minnow Kill Kennedy, you know, and he viewed that. And then I spoke to him a second time. His name was Jay Leahy. He was one of the floor managers at Essen Eisenhardt. And when the limousine was received by them, I don't know, it was four weeks later or whatever, uh, after the assassination, when they were going to start, you know, rebuilding the car for LBJ. Uh, another guy by the name of um, Arlo Childers found the slug. This now, happened in Detroit? When I first de- in Cincinnati. Oh, Cincinnati. Now, when I, when I, at Hessen Heisenhardt, now when I first, Heard the story, I, you know, I interviewed the guy. I just, you know, forgot about it. And then years later, when I saw Wilson and what he had discovered in that area, because in my mind, you know, I was told this guy, Arlo Childers, his area of expertise was trim. He was a trim guy. So when I heard trim, in my mind, I'm thinking what you mentioned earlier about that indentation in the, in the, uh, above the windshield, Jim, you know, that, you, that we've seen in the FBI photographs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So in my mind, I'm thinking, well, that's that's where they found the slug. But, it, you know, couldn't have been that because the photos were taken long before, you know, with no slug in there, long before the car was even received in Cincinnati. So when I went back to my interview, lo and behold, the guy is saying, no, it was uh, it was the, the slug was found above the car in the arch that you would put the roof on. So here is the guy in Cincinnati who actually found and removed the very slug that you see in Wilson's work on the Mormon photograph. Mm-hmm. And I've never shared that with almost anybody. Where, where do we think that was fired from? Good question. I don't know. Well, most likely the trajectory would have been second flat. floor of the Daltex building, perhaps. Flat, a flat trajectory, right? It had to be. It had to be. Mm-hmm. So... But 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 anyway, it just shows that ev- evidence photographically and scientifically is now corroborated with someone who physically found the very, you know, bullet evidence that that, that we're seeing in, in Wilson's image processing. So you know, I I would tell that story to anybody who calls Wilson and his work, you know, fraudulent or garbage in and garbage out. You know, never never. So, All right, next. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we're going to get to uh, image number two. Let's talk about Gordon Arnold. Woo-hoo. We're there. Now, uh, image, tw- image 12, I think, is, is uh, uh, a screen grab from Gordon Arnold being filmed on the middle of Killed Kennedy, you know, and, and he, he's, you know, with the camera showing them where he was at the time he was taking his film. <clears throat> so let's go, let's, let's take a look at his story for a second. On August 22, 1978, Earl Golds wrote an article for the Dallas Morning News, and quote, as the presidential limousine came down Elm Street toward the triple underpass, Arnold stood on a mound of fresh dirt and started rolling his film. He said he felt the first shot come from behind him, only inches over his left shoulder, he said. Quote, I had just gotten out of basic training, Arnold said. In my mind, live ammunition was being fired. It was being fired over my head, and I hit the dirt. Arnold, then 22, said that the first two shots came from behind the fence. Quote, close enough for me to fall down on my face. He stayed there for the duration of the shooting. Mm-hmm. Now, Gordon Arnold, like Tom Wilson, is another one that takes the hit on the internet is lying. You and know why? The story you know why? For attention and money. You know why, Rick? And, and the, well, the, the main thing they use is we don't see him in any of the photographs. Therefore, logically, he was never there and he concocted the whole story. That's what you hear from all these people well, on the internet. 
Also, besides that, he was featured in a uh, study called A Rich Man's Trick, and uh, where he was brought out as a crisis actor who uh, what? just... What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, rich man's trick. I've heard of that film, but I never remembered seeing anything about that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Check it out. In um, Who's Who in JFK? It says, recent computer enhancements of the Mary Mormon photograph substantiate Arnold's statements. In the Mormon photograph, photograph, the man directly behind Arnold firing a rifle over the fence appears to be wearing a policeman's uniform and has long been referred to as Batman. So yeah, but uh, what, the Rick, what, what, what Rick is uh, talking about right now, he's never heard about the comment that I just made about uh, that uh, documentary that I just it's on the internet, you know, you can find it there. Well, and they, well, uh, you know, the, the, the beauty is that people can come up with comments or, or, or speculation on yeah. anything that they want. But the thing is, again, the only thing that, that we need to do is corroborate things right. to find the truth. So I'm going to corroborate right now for you, Gordon Arnold's statement. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with a statement from, an S, from a Secret Service report done a few days after the assassination. And this is from Secret Agent Thomas Johns in the follow-up car behind LBJ. Quote, on the right side of the motorcade from the street, a grassy area sloped upward to a small two or three foot concrete wall with a sidewalk area. When the shot sounded, I was looking to the right and saw a man standing, then being thrown or hit to the ground. Mm -hmm. And this together with the shots made the situation appear dangerous to me. And it was confirmed by Congressman Yarbrough, of course. Right, that man Yarbrough in the Men of Kill Kennedys, it, it, we know, we've heard his statement already, but here's the Secret Service guy stating the same thing. Now, I'm going to read this next thing to you in its entirety because a lot of people may not even know it exists or were familiar with it or aware of it. And I think what, what, what's in this is very important, so hopefully you'll bear with me. This is an HSCA statement of a telephone contact with Rosemary Willis on 11-8-78 for the HSCA. Now, when I saw this, first of all, I thought, well, this is kind of interesting because I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys know more about this than I do, that the HSCA never went to Charles Brem or uh, Bill Newman or, um, or the motorcycle policeman to yeah. ask or get statements or testimony from them. And yet they're contacting somebody who was 11 years old at that time. Why would they do such a thing? What could she tell them? Well, this is what she had to say. Notwithstanding her father's admonition to stay with him on the grass section of the southwest corner of Houston and Elm Street, he was running. she ran alongside JFK's limousine almost to the triple underpass. Wow. Let that sink in. Mm -hmm. She managed to stay on the grass area estimates that she was within three car lengths of the underpass before she stopped. In retrospect, she realized by running alongside JFK's limousine, she had inadvertently had given herself the opportunity to view the spectators on the grassy knoll as the background as she watched JFK. She is still able to recall two people who were conspicuous, one, by holding an umbrella, obviously more concerned with opening it and closing it than dropping to the ground, like everyone else, except a second person. Gordon Noel? Who, uh, except a second person, she saw, who had been standing just behind the wall section, nearer to the joining area of the underpass and grassy knoll. The latter person seemed to be there, yet disappeared the next instant. Uh, so 
uh, let's see, it was this part. Pin, oh, this is still from the HSCA uh, contact report. Pinpointing this location further, it could best be described as the corner section of the white wall between Zabruder's right side and the top of the concrete stairway leading up from the approximate center of the grassy knoll. Now, she's also telling us here that there was a man behind that white wall in that corner just at the top of the stairs leading up from Elm Street who was there and then all of a sudden he wasn't. Because he hit the ground? I think that's second. Yeah, that's more corroboration, the fact that there was a man there and that man was Gordon Arnold. He hit the in deck. In my opinion. He hit the deck. <clears throat> also, as part of this HSCA interview, they also talked to her father, and he was talking about uh, uh, the slides, the photos, and they and they said that Mr. Willis's second photo, which would be actually Will Willis number six, depicts practically the same scene, except the limo is further down the street. Actually, the limo has already left at this point. And then what appears to be a head behind the corner section of the wall, previous men previously mentioned in Willis five, is no longer visible. Black dog. Man. So what they're saying, so, so so what they're saying is basically in Willis five, so Willis saw what he perceived to be at least the head of somebody in that in that photograph, and then in the next photo he took Willis six, that person is no longer there. So now you have that from the Willis family. <clears throat> um, let, shall we move on to Ed Hoffman? Yeah, yeah right. I just I just took the next. How are we doing slide. on time? How are we doing on time, Gary? Oh, uh, we got like two or three minutes left. We might have oh, wow. to do a part two. Oh, wow. We're gonna have to because we still have a little ways to, a little ways to go. All right. a little ways to go. So but image Gary, number Gary, thirteen. Gary, 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 couldn't we just run over? I think uh, I think Rick's probably got ten or fifteen minutes max to go here. All right. Well, let's just go ahead and roll through them. All right, we'll do that. We'll do this quick. We'll get we'll get through this quickly then. Image number thirteen. Uh, uh, now I believe is that Ed Hoffman on the yeah, yeah. on the set of JFK. Yes. Yeah. With, okay, so th those those are the men with Ed that he described as he had witnessed, and I guess they dressed him up for the movie, but then they never used it. But uh, nevertheless, that's. <clears throat> that's what the, the man that Ed Hoffman described and what he saw. So now I'm going to read you something from uh, Lee Bowers. And we know, we, we know who he is. Yeah, he's up in the tower. Uh, he's up in the he's tower. He's in the tower. Right. And he's looking down over the parking lot. Quote, there were at the time of the shooting, in my vision only, two men. Uh, these two men were standing back from the street, somewhat at the top of the incline, and were very near two, sh two trees which were in the area. And one of them, from time to time, as he walked back and forth, uh, disappeared behind a wooden fence, which is also slightly to the west of that. Uh, these two men, to the best of my knowledge, were standing there at the time of the shooting. One of them, as I recall, was a middle-aged man, fairly heavy set, with a dark suit, a tie, and a white shirt. And he remained in sight practically all the time. The other individual was with slightly different, slight, slighter build, and had either a plaid jacket or a plaid shirt on. Mm -hmm. So we have Lee Bowers describing these two men that Ed Hoffman has described. Now, what I just told you has never been seen because it's an outtake from Rush to Judgment that was never used. Right. In that, the actual uh, Lane, final that, edit. Mark Lane, that Mark Lane uh, did those interviews. So, very important interviews. He, yeah. he in interviewed Bowers, but, but this whole statement of describing the men and what they were wearing never made it into the film. Right, right. And what I read you is from a transcript of all of the, uh, uh, of the footage that, that D'Antonio had shot 
interviews and such for his movie. Now, when I found out about this, I caught and Theo De Antonio had already passed away. I contacted his wife because I was looking to see, well, can we get the raw footage, you know, that I just described to you and, and see it on film. And she said, well, all of his materials and film and, and outtakes and everything had been do donated to. And I must be confused with this, Jim, because I thought she said to me, University of Minnesota. And that's where you're from, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but, I, but you I, would know I, if the D'Antonio collection w resided there. So it probably wasn't there. So in my mind, it probably was University of Michigan. But nevertheless, yeah. she told me what university it was. I contacted their archives there. I said that, you know, I understand you have the D'Antonio collection and its footage, and I'm trying to locate the footage that pertains to this, you know, uh, interview transcript. And they looked for it. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Surprise. All the footage is gone. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It was not the University but, of Michigan. But that, um, Right, so it must have been Michigan. But nevertheless, here's one more example of corroboration for a witness that's taken a lot of hits, you know, at Hoffman over the years as being a liar and in for the money well, and in for the notoriety and all that, that stuff. You know? Don't say that to Casey, Brian, and... and uh, no, I, I you know. Uh, but, but again, these are trolls on, on the internet. So, you know, we take that for what it's worth. But now image 14, this is very interesting. Yeah, we got it. I got a map. I got a map here for you. You see, you see the map? Yes, you do. Okay, you see gunman number one, which is in the badge man position. You got gunman number two in the Ed Hoffman gunman position. And from gunman number two, you got a shot fired from him going through the Stemmons freeway sign. At what uh, at what time frame uh, in the uh, Z uh, timeline? Oh, I I, I couldn't tell you where, anything where, about that. Where roughly was the limo at the time that shot was fired? He's like one eighty, when maybe some of the uh, frames that were missing, one seventy seven, seventy eight. Uh, you know those, or is that uh, would that be accurate, or would would it be because you know? Obviously, that's uh, with a limo further up Elm Street, you know. Uh, so uh, what do you think, Jim? Well, yeah. you know, I mean, it, 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 the, the, the missing frames, that was such a blatant thing to do. Had to because something spectacular happened to the stem. Like side. this. I, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, that it really fragmented that it was discernible that a bullet hit the sign so yeah didn't they take it out the next day the very next day the sign okay. i had heard that you mean the the real stem and sign out of dealing plaza man. it was removed yeah. right away well because it had a bullet hole in it yeah and then Go when ahead. they reconstructed the film, they put it back in the wrong place. You know, we have that John Costello nailed that. All right. So, <clears throat> well, uh, we're going to look at those. We're going to look at the, you know, the, the Stemmons Freeway yeah, sign here, in a here, second. Right. I've just but, turned but, to it. Yeah. I've just turned to the but Stemmons before, sign before. You can see where the O, you can see the hole in where the O is and Stemmons. Very good, Rick. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah, that's yeah. from that's that that that's from Willis Five. And just to corroborate that, I'm not sure what film this came from. The next image, number sixteen, is from a, another film. It's a grab shot showing the Stemmons Freeway sign. And once again, it's already it's, has the, the, anom the anomaly. It already has the anomaly, of course. So you got six in photo 16, same thing. And number 17, I found this on the internet. Somebody had made an illustration for people with their eyes who can't see the damage to the O and the stem and sign, uh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, that's fairly funny. Really good. <clears throat> hey, you know, Ralph Sinke went up there the other day and put up a sign, you know, uh, holding it up and everything, trying to match a Z film or something like that, right, Jim? 
I think that's right, Larry. And of course, he couldn't do it because the Z film has uh, gotten a misplaced sign. So, <laughs> well, uh, I'm I'm not sure how much more I'm on, how much more time I have, but quickly, I want to take you through this. So, the map that we just looked at, with those gunmen in it, and the and the and the knowledge the shot through the Simmons Freeway sign. Um, where where do you think I got that map? <laughs> This uh, one that's on the, the, the one that's on the on the screen right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that we looked at, the map yeah, with the gunman in the. Jesse, oh wait, Jesse Curry's uh, book. Just a nope. A stab. <laughs> no, I won't keep you in suspense. The map with the two gunmen in those positions, I think we've established now, and a whole damage the Stemmons Freeway sign, which. I, I believe we just looked at the photograph showing that damage came from a book called Farewell America written oh, in yeah, 19, yeah, right. right. yeah. 1968. James Hepburn. Uh, in, yeah. yeah. The French intelligence wrote that book. And in 1968, they knew that there were those two shooters and damage to the Simmons freeway sign. Now I'm going to read you what was in the appendix in the back of that book, which I think is important. Quote, we challenge United Press International to release and to allow international experts to examine the complete and uncropped photograph taken by a Dallas resident, Mrs. Mormon, and to which it holds the rights. We have copies of this photograph, uh, reports from the two best laboratories in Europe, leave no doubt as to its authenticity. It, sh it shows President Kennedy from the back at the very instant that he was struck by the fatal bullet, but it also shows in the background two of the gunmen described uh, or designated on the map is gunman one and two on the map. The Maybe first gunman, is still, the, the, the first gunman is still holding his rifle. The second has just pulled the trigger and is clearly distinguishable behind the barrel of his gun. Now, obviously, the, the Mormon photographs that we refer to now that's available to us, there's retouching to hide gunman number two. This is the, the gunman that the Ed Hoffman had seen. But he, he definitely is there. And, um, and, and the French intelligence in 1968 put it in a book, which we never made it to the United States. We but didn't find it. They, they were found in a warehouse in Canada, I believe, in, in the early 90s. But you know what? I went to the Boston Public Library and I found it, Jim, in Portuguese. In Whoa. Portuguese, God. <laughs> I think I right, got so it. Let's quickly, I think we're, we're, we're down to the wire here. Let's go to image number 18. I'm there. Okay. Uh, we're back to the uh, tight shot, the Willis 5 photograph. And we'll, and it shows an example, in my mind anyway, with the naked eye, I hope you could see it. There's extensive retouching in the background behind, you know, in that picket fence area. You could see they're hiding something in this image. And, and, um, and then we have that image of what, what has been described by Robert Gro Groden as the black dog man. Um, <clears throat> the interesting story about this slide, Willis 5, is the fact that Willis went to the Kodak lab that day and was accompanied by the FBI. And he looked at his slides after they were developed, but then at some point he turned, it all, turned them over to the FBI and it's months later, he got the slides back. And <laughs> this is according to his, his daughter, Linda Willis. His, her father, Phil, was very upset because when he got his slides back, he saw they'd been altered. You can see his the original box cars. Slide, you can see the box cars. Yeah, and in the right. original slide, you could see the train through the slats of the pergola on the right. <laughs> they had been whitened in on the on the slides that was returned to him. So if they're going to do that to hide the pergola, the train behind the pergola, then they certainly are capable of retouching that area behind the ba the black dog man. Yeah. yeah. So um, so that brings us to our final image here. Image 19. Yeah, I think I got it already up, the comparison, right? You know, yeah. and, and the thing about the, about the retouching on the uh, Willis, they had to, it had to be so meticulous to go in through 
all of the different squares, you know, of the, uh, the uh, uh, what do you call it? The uh, blocks the there that made up. Yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. ornamental blocks, you know, <clears throat> and they had, and, you know, to go into each and every one of them to erase the, the uh, train, you know, it is incredible. Well, the work they did on all the films and photographs was beyond comprehension. But well, I mean, the that's a show survived. for another. The, right, but exactly. Well, the, they got to see, you know, they'd done the work on it. They felt comfortable letting it into the public domain. But the, this final image here, this really brought it home for me because you've got side by side the image uh, from Willis Five of the quote unquote black dog man mm -hmm. in the exact same position Gordon Arnold put himself in in shooting the men who killed so Kennedy. Of course, pressing uh, Gordon Ar Arnold is what you're saying. So what I'm saying is Gordon Arnold was the black dog man. Right, and they were suppressing. And the black dog man was created. They retouched that that part of the image to hide Gordon Arnold diving Absolutely. to the ground Absolutely. and reacting to a shot that was fired from behind, you know, the fence behind him. Absolutely. So Gordon Arnold, you know, for people who said there's no photographs of Gordon Arnold, well, there's a reason for that. But, yeah, he's in Willis 5. He's just been retouched. Hey, hey Rick, he's even tilted a little bit, you know, over like he's almost. Well, I think he's probably, well, he's probably diving toward the, the ground right. at that point, hey. perhaps, <laughs> as, as, he, as he stated. Hey, you know. hey what, what about uh, the uh, Noel Rider, you know, and Gary... Uh, uh, made that comment when we did uh, the the uh, JFK Horseman. Hey man, if I had a, a, a Harley coming at me, I'd be running my ass away from that. <laughs> yeah, Rick, Rick, this has well, just Gordon, been well, well, well. The thing is, the black the black dog man in Willis Five is reacting to a shot that's just been fired past his left ear that just went through the Stemmons Freeway sign, which we can see the damage on, and, yeah. and this is all in Willis Five, the okay. whole sequence. I so at one end, you got, you got Ed Hoffman seeing the gunman firing. Then you got in front of that fence, Gordon Arnold reacting to that shot, yeah. which has now gone through the Stemmons Freeway sign. And we're getting this from the Willis 5 photograph. And, and so, unfortunately, I, it took me 30-something odd years to realize that, unfortunately, and I, I'd hate to think Nigel Turner realized or knew about this, but certainly I'm going to put this in Gary Max. Uh, uh, corner that they led us to believe that 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 figure in the Mormon blow up that Jack White had worked on was in fact Gordon Arnold, mm -hmm. and 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 because they wanted to sell the fact that Arnold could corroborate the badge man that's also in that image, but right. in, now what we've come to realize is the fact that yeah there's a cameraman there right near the, the in front of the uh, the badge man uh, shooter, but it wasn't Gordon Arnold; it was Shauna Willis's father. I can get uh, I can get Chana Willis uh, for a show anytime you guys want. You know, oh, or, or, you know, man. you guys let me know, man. We'll get we'll, we can get her. What you waiting Rick, on, Rick? Rick, we want to bring you back. I mean, this has just been sensational. I can't thank you enough. Really excellent. Yeah. All right. So, uh, any hey, close words? Jim, there, Rick? The last time we did this was 15 years ago, so I don't know. <laughs> so we'll have to wait another 15 years to no, do it I again. But so. uh, I don't think so. Yeah. That wouldn't yeah. work on my agenda. All right, so mm -hmm. all right, you're ready. To well, I can't believe class. we got through all of that stuff. So we did it. Good job. Just, Good job. It's a little Good longer. Job. So all right, everyone. Look, this has been JFK show number 288. Jim Fetzer, Larry Rivera, me, Gary King, and Rick Russo. We really Peace. appreciate you. And we'll see you next week.